You're listening to Wild Things and Wild Places, a Muley Fanatic Foundation podcast that aims to discuss issues and efforts related to the Muley Fanatic Foundation mission, the conservation of mule deer, furthering the sport of hunting, and sound wildlife management. Everybody knows I'm a Muley Fanatic. It's time for Wild Things and Wild Places, and here's your guide, Joshua Corsi. Welcome to Wild Things and Wild Places. And joining me today, this is exciting to, to share with you. Not only do we have Neil Aitken with me, and we're going to talk about some great things that really, I think, will, will be of great interest to anybody who has had any interest in deer hunting. I think you'll find that you've heard the terminology, Neil. Do you know what goat is? Goat? Have you ever heard of someone being referred to as the goat? No. Okay. Goat, if, I, as an acronym, is uh, greatest of all time. Okay. Have you ever been referred to as the goat? Yeah, I thought it was bad. Oh, no, no, it's not bad. No, you're the goat. Uh, you, you are actually, you, you were recognized last March as part of Mule Deer Days as the 2023 Life Member of the Year for the Muley Fanatic Foundation. Certainly, I think you were very deserving of that recognition. And I think it's important that we just share and tell others a little bit about you because you've got an incredible story. First, you're a strapping young man. Date of birth? one twenty three thirty one. 31 So that makes you 92, right? Pretty close. 92 years young. And you love deer. Okay. You, you do love deer? Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell me the first time you went deer hunting. In Wyoming, 1956. And Lysite, Wyoming. Outside, the, it's a little town outside of Riverton, takes you go. And from there on, I came out every year till now. But things have changed a lot in the last few years. Yeah. You see, I, I can't imagine. You can't live 92 years and not see a lot of change. Yeah. yeah. In those years, you could come to Wyoming and buy a non-resident license. It was $20. And you could hunt anywhere in the state for your mule deer. And then once in a while, they had an extra tag and you could kill two mule deer. And the last time I remember, the last one was in Thermopolis. And you, you had to come back. It was late season and they were in the rut. Uh, but, that would have been a special time to be hunting. But but you, you didn't live in Wyoming at the time. No. Uh, you were in California. Yes. But the trips and the excursions and adventures that you've had coming to Wyoming ultimately made you pack up camp in California and move to Wyoming. Yes. What what year was that? I think 72 or 3. I can't remember exactly. Oh, you've, been, you've been here over 50 years for yeah. sure. So what, when you talk about mule deer, what is it about mule deer that, that gets you excited that you, this has been a passion that you just love to go out and hunt mule deer every year? In California, you hunted black-tail deer where I was at in Southern California, and you could harvest two mule deer. They had to have a fork on one side and a spike in the other. But back in the old days in Southern California, things were a lot different than it is now. It just got harder and harder. A friend had came to Lysite to hunt, and he couldn't make it that year in 56. Two friends and I went to Lysite and hunted. And then from there on, it was every year. And it was less expensive than it is now. You could come up here for $100 if you had three guys, because gas was like 18 cents a gallon. And you pulled your money, and you're all set in a little cramped up, cab of a 56 Ford pickup and then came up and hunted. You always uh, went in Las Vegas and you registered for the big deer thing at the Golden Nugget. Then you came up and then if you killed a decent deer, you stopped there. If you had a fairly good one, then you won prizes. You, you could get rifles and custom weatheries and that kind of stuff. And that was a big deal. And then they finally got to give a new Jeep away and stuff. People got to killing the deer in Utah and stuff and then freezing them and then bringing them in. So the Golden Nugget quit that. People were cheating the contest? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever win a prize in the contest? Yeah. You did, huh? A oh, couple cool. times. Oh, nice. And uh, well, what is it about deer? There's all kinds of things you can hunt, but uh, deer has just been your, your thing. Oh, well, they're neat. And, uh, you know, the California little black-tailed deer, a big one's 120 pounds. And I talked to a fellow that was in California working, and I he said, what are you going to do with that deer? And I said, well, we'll just put its legs together and throw it on our back and carry it out. And he said, yeah, go ahead and try it. And then I knew what he meant. They're quite a 
bigger animal, and they're, they're a lot of fun to hunt because they're a lot different than the black-tailed deer. The black tail, when he leaves, he doesn't, what's in that brush and stuff, and he doesn't stop and look or turn around. At that time, there was a lot of, a lot of deer, and we didn't know where really to go right. We went to the Lyside area, and it was one deer, but if we'd went in other spots, you could kill two deer, but we never did. You like to eat deer? Oh, I love them. Yeah. I've heard you say that's how you live, to, to be as old as you are, is by eating venison. Yeah. They're not very fatty, and yeah, they're just neat. And back in the old days, just after the war and stuff, it was hard to get any meat or anything and stuff, so you got used to deer. And then when you came here, you could just, you could get them processed. And the processing, they could get, you could get the dry ice and one processed at Riverton, and I've got the tickets for $35. For a full deer. Yeah, for a whole deer, and they even skinned it, if you will, and, uh, and they'd do it overnight for you, so, so you could get out and go back home, and they always had a check station, and right there at the intersection, and you didn't get out. You had to stop there, and then you didn't come the way you do now and go straight. You went on the road to Rock Springs. Okay. Turned left. And then when you got into Utah, they stopped you again. And checked your licenses and checked the deer, and then you could go on. They didn't do anything in Utah, but that's the way it was. It's just great, and the deer are neat. They're just something about a mule deer that is, they're just special. To me, they are. Yeah, so you've had the opportunity to harvest several, many, countless bucks, really. Over, Over 70 deer you've harvested in your lifetime. Didn't you have a streak going of 69 years in a row? Yeah. I never missed till three years ago. And the winters or something, and it's just so hard to draw a license in a good area because I don't like to hunt the public areas, but then it gets down to your, your boys and that where it's good your chances are what? One and a half or two percent. Yeah, pretty slim pickings. Huh? Pretty, pretty slim. And yeah. you've got to be pretty lucky. And it's a good place to hunt, and it's got, it's easy access and stuff. Let's talk about uh, just the changes you've seen in equipment that is utilized today compared to when you started. And of course, you mentioned a 56 yeah. Ford. It, uh, vehicles have changed, but personal gear. In those days, you walk, and you had the 3030. Having a four-power scope was a big deal, but you couldn't put them on an old Winchester, and uh, nobody had a four-wheel drive. They had that tow goat in Utah. Here you just drove to a spot and saw a hill on that, and you just walked it. Of course, you were young, and it did, you had a lot of goat power, but you didn't have that. I really don't care for the four-wheelers and that, and the motorcycles. and the, I think it's spoiled a lot of the hunting because they, people, if you killed a good deer, and you had you got your pickup as close as you could, and then you drug it, packed it on out, and now they'd like to they could almost go anywhere. And you got such good weapons, you got the good rifles, and you got the range finders and the maps and scientific stuff. And you never had that. You just went out, and if it looked pretty good, and you saw on the hill, you just walked for it, and that's it. And I think that was 90% of the fun. I, and you came here and the people were pretty good and you could get access almost anywhere if you went and asked the rancher, you looked him up and he said, go to the neighbor and ask him to. And then you had, and they'd even tell you, I've seen deer on a certain spot and go ahead. Because my first license is, I think I was 80 of the non-residents and for that's not very many people to hunt Wyoming. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's... And it stayed that way for, I think, 15 years or so, where you could just come and buy them. And I never realized the good spots till I moved here that there were bigger and better deer in, in, in spots. But you start at one place and get to know people and come and have fun and, and to take your wife and that, and she hunts deer. And it was a family thing. And then pretty soon a few friends saw the big deer that were hunters, and they decided to come, and pretty soon it ended up about 
15 different people, but you all went and yeah, you'd sleep, find no place and sleep and out in the hills or something. It wasn't terrible. But I never knew what a pair of car horns was or anything because when you hunted deer in California, it'd be 120 degrees on August the 5th, and that's pretty doggone hot to go hiking through that grease wood. You had to do it early, and you always had to carry water. Here, you never carried the water, and you just split their legs, got your shoulders through it, and put the deer's head up by your ear and walked out, and the ticks would crawl on you and stuff, but the deer by then only weighed 70 pounds. Yeah, after you feel so dressed. That's yeah. the way that was, Percy. Huh. Tell me about your most memorable hunt. You've had so many, but there, there's got to be a couple that just really stand out that have just mm. been exceptional. I know I've been in your living room and it's you've got a tremendous amount of deer shoulder mounts that to go from the kitchen all the way, wrap around the living room. It's a beautiful setting, sitting in your chair in the evening time and looking at all those memories. But yeah. is there one hunt that stands out that just really resonates mm. with you as, man, that was perfect? I think probably it was the last hunt before my wife passed away. And it was back in Lyosite because I knew that country. And we'd always get our deer and sometimes be out by nine o'clock in the morning to check station. And she had dementia and that stuff. A fairly good little deer ran out. She shot it with one shot and that. I got another one when we went back and that was the last deer hunt because she, she killed a moose. The dementia was pretty bad and that's a bad thing to have. And she loved to hunt. She was a Good sh shot with a shotgun and stuff. I, can, I think that was it. I and mean, I miss it. And I miss her, too. It's not the same. I'm lucky I got Roddy Anderson. And that to take me under their wing, or I'd probably be in. You just don't get around when you're in your 90s as good. You ache and moan and groan, but they take care of you. And they put you on the spot and turn you loose and keep an eye on you. It's people care about you a little bit while you hunt mule. Do you make a lot of friends? When I bought a few governor tags and commissioner tags to get to hunt the good places. And uh, that always worked out with they got good eyes and help. So that's just the way it is. And I'm sorry it isn't the way it was 20 years ago. But as I said about the hunters and the technology and things, and the weather, it's a tough deal to get these mule deer back. I, I don't know. It might be years. Yeah, I was just going to ask you what you've seen a lot of changes, not only in hunting, but you've also seen a lot of changes with the deer on the landscape in the 1950s and 60s, 70s, 80s. You weren't aware of a thing called chronic wasting disease. Where you live now in Shoshone, chronic wasting disease is very prevalent. You've seen the direct impacts of that disease with the deer in your area. The deer have taken it on the chin. There's no doubt about it. But I guess we got to think that the that there's still some hope out there. How, how do you feel when you think about the next generation and moving forward with not only our hunting heritage, but just with deer in general, I mean, is it something you feel good about or is it something that you're just very concerned about? Well, I'm concerned about it because, you know, the game and fish, that's a tough deal to, uh, they realize what it is, but it's tough to deal with people who want to come out of staters and in staters. And I don't think that they change from four point to three point and then they get it. Th it's a four point. But they look at the eye guards and up there over an inch long. And they in the old days, the hunters weren't horror conscious like they are now. They've got the deals were, gee, I, a 200-inch deer, 30-inch deer, and that. They, they have a competition deal. Look what I killed and that. They really, sometimes you don't think that they do it for the they do it for the challenge to beat the other guy. I'll show him. I'll get him a bigger deer this year. And I think, I don't know what the answer would be to bring them back. You can't. They've cut the quotas. They've done everything. But you can't just shut off the sport. But it takes a better guy than I to figure out the solution. I don't think they'll ever come back like they are be 10 years if then, if the weather stays good. If you were to visit with somebody who was just starting to get into hunting, what advice would you give them that you've learned over your lifetime that you wished you would have maybe learned long ago and it just took you a while to get it figured out? Is there a piece of advice out there that you think's worth sharing? 
I think maybe we were a little too serious. It even got to be competition and it should be for the fun to get outdoors and see the animals and be in Wyoming. The country is neat. People are pretty good. If you don't shoot a great big deer or even if you don't get a deer, you brought your family out or your friends and had fun on one home, call it that because it's really more than killing. It's the sport. To kill something is, is I don't think it's number one. Uh, fun to get out outdoors and the companionship and that and make new friends out of state and uh, go here and go there and look at the sites. That means more. If you get the good thing, it's a bonus. And it's just a lot of luck. Yeah. I've seen a, a picture I've had hanging on my bulletin board for years now that uh, I had got from you when we did a publication feature story on you with you and a bunch of deer on this old Jeep. Tell me about that, hon. I look at that picture and I just think, man, that we not growing up in that era, think of that as the heyday of deer. It was. And so when you see pictures like that, you, your mind just, just starts to get away from you because you can only imagine what it was like, but you were there. So, so tell me, what was that well, like? The, we managed to get a, a four wheel drive Jeep and get, cause it would get muddy up in that country. And then the four guys, you, you just let four good horns go and that, and you, it wasn't really a problem. You just saw a whole lot of deer. It was a whole different. Wall game, you, the minute it got daylight and you got in the sagebrush and you went slow and looked and you'd look in the side hills and that, you see a deer, you thought you'd go, you'd walk up to him and there was just, you couldn't believe the amount of a deer there was. Like in Pinedale and that country in there, you could kill two big deer apiece and stuff up there. And most of the state was just one deer and then. They did have the two deer deal every so often for a late season thing, but I don't know. It's just, it's just neat. And you got to see a lot of, you didn't have to, you didn't really have to hunt them. They were just there. That's the way it was. And if you come upon a sheep herder up there or somebody, or a guy killing coyotes for the government and stuff, you ask him what he's seen and he'd tell you, I saw so-and-so over Two or three draws look like a pretty good. And you do that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it just, it'll never be like that again. It can't. It, yeah, it's uh, unbelievable how good it was. But there wasn't very many people that had traveled to, to do it. It just, they concentrated a lot on Utah. Because when Utah was on, Wyoming hadn't started for a couple, two or three days. And we'd come through there. And it'd just be vehicle after one another, and tote goats and campers and pickups and all that stuff. And you'd go up that strawberry reservoir country in there, and they were just, they, I think Utah had a ton of deer too. But everything, look at all the people we got. I don't know, of course. If a guy knew, he'd be pretty smart and try to do it. But I don't think the deer herds will ever come back like they used to be. They've got to, Stay with this management program. They're doing pretty doggone good now. They cut everything down pretty good. License isn't that much for a resident. And the non-resident, he he doesn't mind paying an extra $100 for that. They yeah, you're right. Some... The, re the resident has it pretty good, don't we? Yeah. We, we got a pretty, pretty, good, pretty good license fee. It's the cheapest thing of the entire hunt, to be quite honest yeah. with you. And then when you get up in my age and it's six, over 65 and stuff, then you get into the Pioneer deal. You could fish and game birds and stuff for nothing. And, and then when you buy a deer license, and that's $7 for an old guy. They're awful good to you on that point. And they're good to the old persons. The game wardens do the best they can. You could talk to them and they'll give you an honest answer. Yeah, what's it look like up there? And they'll tell you, all the good luck, pay attention and look. But at the campsite behind there hasn't been very many deer or elk or whatever antelope. They try to help you and steer you right. At, I don't know, of course. At, at 92, do you, do you still have a goal? 
for deer and hunting for your well, own personal interest? Yeah, I'd like to. Everybody would like to kill one good last one. I don't, I'm not having very good luck myself with it. That'd be my goal is just one more. When you're in your 80s, you've lived five years longer than they want you to. And you don't get around that. But you get the handicap things and, and that kind of stuff. And you can't walk your knees are bad and you fall asleep. And the young kids would look at him out there. He just doesn't have the poop he used to have. But you still enjoy it like I'm enjoying this deal. And it's wonderful to get out. And I've come to the point where if I've had fun and they have fun and beautiful country and it is, go home and thank God you made it fast forward. That's right. all I know. Your, your favorite favorite way to prepare deer to eat it? How, how do you like to cook it? If we get a deer this evening or tomorrow? I'm partial to the back straps and that, and the teeth aren't too good for the steak, so I haven't made a lot of hamburger. But you know, the deer aren't that strong. I'm not sold on the antelope, but the mule deer and the elk are great. I probably butchered up an antelope and it seemed a little bit strong. So I'm not much of a, I don't care much about the antelope. And they're hard. Yeah, they run a lot. So anyhow, I end up at uh, Colonel Sanders half the time. I'm not much of a cook along. Nothing like some good old gravy and potatoes yeah. at Colonel Sanders. Yeah, mashed potatoes and gravy and fried the potatoes and do it all in the skillet. One thing I think it's worth noting, because uh, you, you referenced it earlier, but we share a very close mutual friend, Rowdy. You're part of his family in my mind. I think in his mind, you're part of their family. You and him have had some incredible hunts a couple of times in Mexico, Montana, of course, a lot of time together in Wyoming. And now you see him and his family as his children are getting older and Basin, he's quite the hand, isn't he? A wonderful kid. And he pays attention and I feel sorry for Basin because I don't think he'll never have it like I did when I was yet young, but maybe things will turn. And and you get lucky, and they we have some good years and stuff, and then he can be back. But the way it is now, it's tough for a, a young guy. But if his dad wants to take him like Rowdy takes Basin and show him, and they got good eyes and how to handle a, a weapon and and that kind of stuff, the companionship, being out with the mom and the kid and the kids, that's a big deal. Yeah. What, what would, what advice would you give to Rowdy as he's mentor in the next generation? Is there anything, advice that you've had an observation that you think would be worth passing on to Rowdy as he's taken on an active role of responsibility to, to ensure that next generation follows suit? He's a very smart young man and he's a good hunter and I know that he'll teach his boys and the daughter probably too the right way to do things and be careful and enjoy things. And I don't know, I wouldn't, I don't have any worries about Basin making it because he minds and he, the gun deal, he doesn't get into the pickup or whatever with bullets in the barrel and that kind of stuff and puts them in the right spot and uses the binoculars and does a lot of walking because both of them are in good shape. And I think that deal will work out with him. Speaking of binoculars, you, you've got some binoculars. I seen them this morning. Those things must weigh 10 pounds. Those, Those are, are old. They're 50 years old. <laughs> but they still work, right? Yeah. And like I was saying, we never had spotting scopes. And you didn't have range finder. But you have changed rifles. Yeah. You're not using a thirty thirty anymore. You've You've upgraded the rifle. Oh, yeah. Do you miss the days, though, of carrying a lever action in the woods? Yeah, I do. It was, you didn't hurt, worry about bumping this or scratching this or doing that. The 30 and the 56 Fords and the two-wheel drive trucks people had up here, and it just all went together. You'd come up here to hunt one year, and the rancher would have one headlight out, and you'd come back the next year, and the same headlight was out. And they didn't worry about scratching it. They didn't have these big fat tires we got now. And if they wanted to go, they'd chain up the rear tires. And, and that just, it was a different life. 
I think the young men now will adapt to it, but all this technology and the cell phones where you can look and map, I think that makes it tougher for the animals too, because it makes it better because you know where you're not going to trespass and do that kind of stuff. And where, But the technology of everything and these good rifles that'll shoot two or 300 yards dead on, that makes a lot of difference in the old days. You didn't shoot like that with open sights on the thirty thirty. You got close to them at maybe 100 yards or so. You might try it, but you're not going to do much. Do, do you have, Neil, do you have a memory of a hunt where it was just, it challenged everything you had of who you were and what you were about and the, the situation you were in? Did you have a hunt or an experience where maybe it was weather or I, I don't know. Is there one where it just really... I've been stuck, and you think you're going to freeze to death, and they figure, I'll burn my spare tire. You didn't have the cell phone to call, but you had a shovel with you and that kind of stuff, and tried to dig your way out, and then pretty soon maybe somebody just happened to come along that muddy or snowy road and give you a hand. You Later on, you'd put a winch on the front, but you don't want to be pulled in. You want to be pulled out. And for the winches I've had, I never had to hold it. Never used them that much. You had they look. But did you ever have to burn your spare tire? I had a friend that had to do that in the gas hills. Really? Yeah. And that one winter, he burned his spare tire, and they saw the smoke come out and rescued him. But he didn't have a phone or anything, but they saw the fire. Yeah, I've always heard of that as a kind of a last-ditch effort to to signal for help or yeah, or try to alert that the situation is very dire. But I would imagine you're in a pretty bad spot if you're burning a spare tire. Yeah, and he was in... I imagine it's probably pretty hard to even get a spare tire to light on fire. Yeah, I don't know how he did that. And then naturally, maybe he siphoned some gas out or did something, but the, the truck wouldn't run either, so he was in a bad shape. And uh, people know the gas hills and out there, you could be in pretty bad shape, freeze. Wyoming's weather can it, do you in if you're not yeah. prepared. And it comes quick. Yeah, it does. Well, I've learned that. You look and you see it start to cloud up. You may, if the road isn't right, you better start to go home. That's just the way it is. So, Neil, would you prefer to, if you could write the script for the perfect deer hunt, would you prefer to, to harvest your, your animal in the morning or in the evening? In the morning. So you have all day to yeah. deal with it. And then in the evening, if you should happen to wound it, and you've got to find it and that, and then it gets dark for you, that's a bad deal. Of all the deer you've harvested in your lifetime, have the majority of them been in the morning? Yes. Yes. Very few in the evening. Usually you get, you're tired, and, and about noon or one, you say, I'll come back the next day. And you go home. But yeah, I don't like the evening things are tough. And I just noticed some of the things they do. And you see them on television with the white tail back east. They shoot them from a blind, but you always see them trying to find them in the dark. So they've got the arrow that lights up and does all that. And I'm not much for archery, but guys are good with them. But there you again, you go with a bow and arrow. The technology on these bows has changed. Everything has changed, and hasn't it? You see them, they got those, yeah, they're just different deal crossbows are dead. That's like a rifle, huh? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You see them, they're 100 yards. They're just dead on. Three inch. They're hard to carry. <laughs> I tried them, and they're, they're just hard on your back, and if you're trying to carry them walking through a brush or something, they're a, a pain in the neck. So I gave that up. Do, do, you, do you have a good luck charm when you're hunting? I usually, yeah, I used to. Keep one bullet all year in my pocket. Oh, really? Well, where did that come from? And I don't know. And a couple of guys I worked with did that. And then that was the first bullet put in the chamber to kill your deer. He carried it all year. Yeah. Oh, that's it cool. will carry it all year. Shiny and like to wore it out. That's just, people have some peculiar ways of doing things on the deer hunt. You're always nervous the night before. I grew that anymore because. I haven't had very good luck, so if it just happens, it happens, and I'm not upset if it hasn't. I got and had good friends that enjoyed it. Yeah. What range is, what's your comfort comfort range distance-wise for shooting a deer? Oh, 
Do you feel good up to 200 yards? I think 200 yards is perfect. Is it? Okay. 100 naturally would be better, but you see these guys on television and that's shooting 1,000 yards and 800 yards with these high-powered rifles. And you start that, I think, with an L, you can hit him in the leg and you can't even hardly tell it. He just leaves. So there you left a wounded down. Some of those guys you can do it, you practice and practice, but it's awful hard. You shoot 500 yards, that's quite a little ways for a deer. It's not that big. Yeah. And we got a lot of wind and other elements in Wyoming. And, yeah. I mean, you, you can develop that skill set. And I have friends that really, they have. They, they put a lot of time. They, they have the confidence to do that because they put that time. And you've got the it's not everybody. And you got the sticks that we never had. And you had to lay down or get a rock for a rest, limb or something. Now they got those nice sticks and buy a tripod on the front of the gun and they can lay down. That makes things a lot or eliminates a lot of that wounded stuff. Tell me about this. I've had a few people that have talked about the importance of various pieces of gear when hunting. Quite a few people have referenced glass. Glass is very important. I think that's probably across the board. Probably the majority of people really put a lot of emphasis on having good glass. But I have had some folks talk about the importance of footwear and having good boots, wool socks, and being able to take care of your feet so they can take care of you. Your very first hunt to Wyoming, when you drove out here from California, what gear did you bring? In the 50s and stuff, we just had an old pair of boots or tanner shoes. And like in that picture, you saw our pants. They were like the kids now. The knees were wide open. You, Like I said, I didn't even know what a pair of car hairs was. So you weren't all camoed up. No camo. You didn't know what camo was, and you didn't have all the stuff you got now. These guys are equipped. They got nice vehicles. Yeah, they'll got, to me, they'll complain about paying the resident $5 more for a license. But he'll spend eighty thousand for a truck and another two hundred for beer. That doesn't make sense to me. And then they'll have a eighty thousand dollar pickup and it pulling a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar four wheeler behind it. They're not out there for the meat. They're not hungry like we were. They're out there for the sport and to go. That's just the way things are now. And these poor deer. They just, they get a little wise to all this noise. And I think they're great if you kill something and drive to it. But I don't think they're right to chase them around with them. You can't control. There's a very few guys that are like that. Water some park, walk or something. You, when you first started hunting, the very first hunt you went on, not as the hunter, but as an observer. Was that with your dad or your grandfather yeah. or? Nobody, you just, we had deer at the place in California and I think I was 12 or 13 and the neighbor boy shot a deer on the place and I walked up with it and that deer was there and I saw the bullet hole and I put my finger on that and looked at the deer and I thought, that's pretty doggone neat. He killed it with an old lever action savage. And I thought, I can't remember what year you could get a deer license. I think he had to be. 13 or 14, which you could always kill too anywhere in the state, but that's a chain. That kind of got me, and I thought that was pretty neat. And then you lived right there where they were, and you just, it was all country then, and you just looked. It was. So you went and bought your own rifle at that point, or you had one available to you? Or? Oh, Do you remember? I don't. Yeah. I think went to the feed store and paid $5 a month for a 30 30 and put it on the payment, and the guy at the feed store knew us, and he'd let you have the gun. And I think the rifle was like $75 then, wasn't you? Or a Marlin or something. There, there wasn't the automatics, and there wasn't the magnums, and all that there is now. A twenty-five, thirty-five, or something that held about 20 rounds will clear up the end of the barrel, so they'd shoot on it. And but no one in your house, mom or dad, they weren't hunting at the time? No. So you, you decide, you inform them you're going to hunt, you're going to buy a firearm. Yeah. They, and then they're happy when you bring home meat? Yeah. Yeah. And she'd cook it for you. They could do a better job with the chops and the stuff. And then in those days, you hung your deer, you cut it, and they had a dryer outside that was a 
screen and you hung it in there and made a jerky out of that. The flies couldn't get to it. So the 3030 was it. And boy, if you got a, there was no six fives, two twenty threes or that. You had a 35 Remington or a 300 Savage or something like that coming up. But most people had just had the old Winchester kicks you. And then a Marlin, you could put the scope on top of it, but you couldn't. Regular old thirty thirty because it ejected shell out the top. Marlin threw it out the side, huh? So you could do that. And the first gopes I remember were, I think they were ten. And then they they had the weavers. And if you had a two power, you really had some. But they and they didn't. They were just once in a while you'd go to a second hand place or something and see those old gopes and stuff. But you didn't have a veritable scope or anything like that. Right. You didn't have a, I, I think a four power was a big deal. You carry the same knife all the time? Yeah. You still have it? No, I don't. No, I don't have it. I went to, I think I gave a bunch of weight to the neighbor kid. I got the carbon fiber stuff now, titanium and that. And uh, you get older, you want a light gun. But I might even use a spear. I'm not having very good luck. But they're awful good weapons, and you got some. And they're qu- pretty quiet. And that I've got a suppressor, and it's just heavy on the end for me. And I don't. I got it, but I don't shoot. I just appreciate being able to talk to you about what has truly been a very full lifetime of a passion for deer, a passion for hunting, a passion for being in the outdoors, a passion for sharing it with friends and family. I know it's been a huge part of your life, something that you value greatly and continue to do. Boy, ha- have you ever known anyone who harvested a deer at the age of 100? No, I've never heard of anybody 90. I was going to say, you got eight years to look forward to that, mm-hmm. but yeah, you're right. Um, I- I don't know of anyone myself that's 92 that's harvested a deer. uh, Yeah, I'll be 93 pretty quick, and that maybe I'll get lucky. Yeah. If I don't. We we went out this morning. We we seen some deer, but we're we're looking for we're looking for a buck, and we haven't found that yet. And we're going to go again this evening. And if not, we'll go again tomorrow. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can do a follow up to this recording after we have the harvest. This will be the pre harvest interview, and then we'll do a post harvest interview after we get one. I hope so. Yeah. All right. And I thank you. Yeah, it's always great to talk to you, my friend. And I. I Absolutely. Just uh, enjoy listening to you talk about uh, the way things were, because I think there's great value in learning today that th- there's lessons to be learned from our history and those great experiences. And I, and I think it's probably true that every generation looks at some point as they aged the previous generation, that things were maybe just a little more simpler, maybe just a little bit more wholesome, but you certainly I think I can speak for many and say that you lived in, you lived in a very epic time. If yeah. you were a mule deer enthusiast and you loved the West and the outdoors, there, there's probably never going to be a time like when you got to experience yeah. it. I was very lucky. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to visit with you. And thank you. And that wraps up another episode of Wild Things and Wild Places. But remember, the journey doesn't end here. Make sure you never miss out by subscribing. Whether you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, streaming us on our website, or following us on social media, subscribing is the best way to stay connected. Thank you for joining us, and stay tuned for more wild episodes. Everybody knows I'm a muley fanatic. 